thanks um, to Owen and um, to the Unemployed um, Workers Union for putting on this conference, which is um, so incredibly unimportant. Um, and I'd also like to pay my respects and to the uh, um, traditional owners of this land, the Aboriginal people, and I think it's particularly like important when we have um, discussions about poverty and welfare policy, because there's arguably you know, no group in Australia that is um, more affected by poverty uh, other than the Aboriginal people, and, and in particular, um, because a lot of those um, really harsh, um, punishing welfare policies that um, we're fighting are often tribal, and I use tribal in quotation marks, tribal on Aboriginal people, then gradually um, spread out to the rest of the Australian community, and in particular, um, the policy which I guess um, got me active in this area as an anti-poverty and um, welfare rights activist, um, income management, which is, um, as most of you would um, like remember, started off as part of the um, Northern Territory intervention in um, 2007, in the uh, dying days of the Howard government, was um, extended by the Rudd Gillard government, and obviously continued under the Abbott and Turnbull governments, and it's now entering its um, ninth year, and government and independent evaluations over and over again show that the uh, um, policy is um, failing people. Um, A, because the vast majority of people on um, welfare payments know how to budget their issues, not that they don't know how to manage their money, their issues that they don't um, get enough of it, and B, because um, and there's a small number of people who uh, have genuine issues, whether it's a, um, financial management issues or substance abuse issues, income management is a blunt tool and it doesn't work, it doesn't um, teach people any new behaviours or skills, um, tends to make people who are struggling feel more um, stressed, more humiliated, and um, more than and more demoralised. And actually the story of, of like income management, a policy which the government says is about helping people, but which um, um, seems to um, um, keep getting expanded um, to more and more locations in this um, country, um, despite all the, the research saying that it doesn't improve people's um, financial well-being or personal well-being, and um, despite the fact that um, the people directly affected by the policy, the people who are being put on compulsory income management in the uh, Northern Territory and the Northern Suburbs of Adelaide and a whole number of other sites, including um, the Sojourn and Barrow Group also does quite a bit of work, are saying, you know, we don't need this, um, this is not helping us, in fact, this is um, uh, uh, like making our lives um, uh, like more inconvenient and frustrating. I, I think the income management story is kind of a symbolic of the uh, the bigger picture um, when it comes to how we treat unemployed people and and other people on income support. But I just want to I want to briefly like introduce the, to the group first, and then just um, make some general points about what's happening at the moment when it comes to the uh, treatment of unemployed people. So um, the Anti Poverty Network was formed in late uh, um, 2013, and we started off as an alliance of. Uh, two grassroots groups, one of which um, is no longer active, but the people in that group are still very, very active. And in fact, they're actually the uh, backbone of our group, and they are the um, single parents, and mainly the single mums, who, um, as um, Cassandra mentioned, were the ones who were pushed from uh, parenting payments and single, which is not particularly high to begin with, onto the much, much um, lower view start at the start of um, um, 2013. And so uh, we've been working with, uh, with them for the past um, three years and 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 the way they're really the um, core of our group. And, um, and over that time, um, as they've adjusted to being on a payment, which is um, uh, uh, I was grossly like inadequate um, for adults. And then we for adults who also kids them to support with, you know, um, become more and more aware of um, the extent of the financial hardship they suffer. I mean, unlike thousand organisations say that if you spend 
more than 30% of your income on rent, you're suffering from housing stress, and if you spend more than 50% or suffering from um, housing prices, I'm not sure what their term is for people who are spending 60 or 70 or 75% of their income on rent is. It's obviously pretty diabolical. If that's the situation and you're in, then you have almost no money left, unlike for anything else, you know, for food, um, for going out, you know, you, um, you become like incredibly isolated and obviously has significant impacts on, on your mental health, you know, not to mention obviously on your job searching, you know, it's hard to look for work if you can't afford to leave the house, if you can't afford to run a car and so on. So uh, what happened in 2013 was those um, single parents, um, unlike all finding on their own path, teamed up uh, with another grassroots and community group, which at the time was called Stop Income Management in Playford. They were a network of locals in the northern and suburbs of Adelaide, which is a very low income, high unemployment area. Um, they were fighting um, the introduction of the um, of, of income management, of the uh, basics part. And again, this is something that was um, um, started off in the NT under the coalition, um, but was extended by um, Labour governments into South Australia and, and a number of other sites and um, Shepparton for example being the site in Victoria and so we both realised that um, you know we were kind of working in our own path um, really really hard work because um, you know as much as um, possible you know, we wanted um, our groups and to be led by people who were directly like affected by <coughs> poverty and by unemployment, and in the case of stopping stop income management and Playford, you know the people on income management and themselves, who we were meeting all the time and documenting their stories, and in some cases helping them to appeal, helping them to speak to the media, and just you know um, giving them accurate information. You know, I, I mean, half the time they weren't even like aware that they had rights to appeal, that they had rights um, to apply for exemptions in certain cases and so we realised we had to join forces and connect with the dots that everyone on income support um, regardless of their age regardless of what payment type they're on is the same fundamental interest you're whether it, um, maybe you're on allowance or, or, or a pension and that's what we've tried to do um, for our group and I mean, partly because it makes sense to um, you know um, I have as many allies as possible. I think um, um, something, uh, um, something I've always thought about is the way that um, the whole deserving versus un undeserving poor um, argument often plays out in people's heads. So, you know, if you have a welfare payment, uh, um, you often like internalize um, that sort of thinking and you say, well, you know, I'm going to be a I'm one of the good unemployed people, you know, I'm actually trying, I'm trying to look for work. I'm not like all these other people out there who are, you know, who are comfortable, um, like who are doing well. And so um, we encounter that um, kind of um, thinking all the time. And so one of the things our group um, tries to do is actually um, remind people actually, you know, there's no undeserving um, poor. I mean, A, I mean, virtually everyone out there um, like who's on an income support payment, who's on a very low income, um, would work if they could. I mean, obviously I've all three speakers have outlined that it's a numbers game. At the end of the day, there aren't enough jobs um, to go around. And also um, to break some of those um, barriers, like between, uh, um, for example, the, um, the age pensioners um, have much more um, clout and influence than um, single parents and unemployed people, they're a very large group in some ways, and they're much more well off. And politically, you know, they're different because, you know, they, uh, they earned their, um, their income support. Well, this is the argument, obviously. Uh, I obviously think it's complete garbage. You know, they earned their income support, whereas unemployed people didn't earn their right to income support. So um, that's how we set up. And over time, you know, we've. Uh, we've uh, we've been able to build a group that includes people, um, like virtually every kind of person on income support, um, disability pensioners, age pensioners, unemployed people, um, current and former um, work for adult participants, current and former um, income management clients, um, and I think that's incredibly important. Um, and 
what we've been faced over the last two and a half years is you know kind of um, an intensifying of really what's happened like for like a long time in this country, which is that um, more and more the welfare system is not um, functioning as a um, safety net for people out of work. People out of work largely um, because of structural factors, you know, there's simply not enough work to go around. But it's functioning more and more as a form of punishment, deterrence, and um, and um, victim blaming. And I used um, my income management um, before as an example. There are 25,000 people on income management in Australia, and the vast majority of those are people who were forced onto the program. Um, and obviously, the vast majority of those people are still um, mainly Aboriginal people from the Northern Territory. There are sites elsewhere, and income management kind of symbolises um, where um, welfare is headed. You know, it assumes that um, if you can't find a job, it, it must be um, your body must somehow be um, like incompetent or lazy or, or like irresponsible. It, it assumes that if you're uh, if you're on a low income and you're suffering from financial stress, it must be because you don't know how to properly budget. You, know, you can't control your appetite. You drink or smoke too much. Um, and of course, the government's argument is that income management, you know, perhaps is a form of um, tough love. It's um, you know, it might not be fun, but you know, it's there to it's there to help people to improve their uh, their uh, financial capabilities. And um, by focusing on the individual, they obviously are able to um, um, distract people from the two elephants in the room: the fact that you know. Um, like we have unemployment, uh, not because of the uh, characters or personalities of unemployed people, but because as Bill has mentioned and Cassandra, and if we have unemployment because there aren't enough jobs to go around, and that's quite solvable. Um, I mean, you know, there's no fundamental economic um, reason why we couldn't um, have full employment. The reason why we don't have full employment is um, political and uh, to do with what would happen if. If we had a situation um, where there were like enough jobs to go around, how the uh, balance of power would tilt more in favour of workers who have much more um, um, bargaining power. And that's the other thing about welfare policy. I think it's something that Owen and the Unemployed Workers Union does um, really well, which is you know connecting the dots between you know what's happening to unemployed people, what's happening to disability pensioners, what's happening to um, single months and um, what's happening in the um, workforce in terms of you know the um, like relentless attacks on the uh, union movement and the constant push to chip away at penalty rates and the minimum wage. There are really two sides of the same points. Like I mentioned before, that you know, in, in my view and in my group's view, you know, most of what's happening. Uh, most of what's happening at the moment in, in welfare is about deterrence and, uh, and punishment. It's about creating like an income support and system where people are as desperate as possible to get off the payment and um, to get into work. And obviously, there aren't enough jobs and to go around. In the meantime, um, governments uh, want people to um, um, to furiously um, compete for the uh, like an adequate number of jobs out there. You know, they want um, people to be so desperate that they'll take the most low paid and the most insecure and the most unpleasant um, job. And um, often it's quite explicit, like, you know, if you hear like people talk about um, work for the doll, like, um, like men you know, come out and say, well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's not about, you know, um, giving um, potential like employees new skills. No, it's, you know, it's got nothing to do with that. You know, it's about weeding out the uh, job snobs. I don't, I think that's a quotation from uh, Tony Abbott from the late um, 90s when he was employment minister. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's not about improving people's um, marketable skills. It's about you know, um, um, I'm putting them in a situation where they have to work them for free, and, and you know, that extra pressure and that extra frustration is is going to be enough um, to push them out into the workforce. 
And of course, if you have a look at um, how work for the doll operates, that makes some complete sense. You know, we have people in our group who've been doing um, work for the doll, and uh, um, many of the placements are, you know, quite frankly, Mickey Mouse work. You know, someone gets assigned to a church. Um, the church doesn't have like enough tools and to go around. Um, so their placement is, you know, you spend seven hours and today hand picking um, clothes out of the front of the yard of a church. You know, your your work for the dog placement is hand picking weeds from the Lord. You know, no one's going to put that on their CV. I mean, not that people put work for the dog on on their CV anyway, but that's. Um, um, it's not about improving people's own skills, it's about um, punishing them in the hope that they'll just go out there, find a job, and never give up finding a job. Um, sorry, you had your hand up? Yeah, I've done that, but I want to say two things, sir. Um, the first is, we receive unemployment benefits, that's the lower end of the government payments. The people who are job services providers who keep them with these work for the gold schemes, they get paid for providing that actual service of punishment. The second one, they also get paid like a big lucrative contract. Everybody that gets paid by the Australian government in all these juicy contracts, all these contracts, they're all getting money from the government just like you and me. We're just getting a small amount of it and we get told what to do while they get a big amount and they, they tell others what to do below them. It's very simple. They don't complicate. There's nothing to be guilty about. Yeah, that's actually it. A really good um, segue to my next um, point, which is that I mean, I kind of Sorry about that. No, 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 it's good actually. It's a good reminder for me because I'm uh, I'm uh, slightly unprepared. When I uh, I arrived in um, Melbourne last night, um, someone else walked off the plane with my um, carry-on luggage, and so for several hours I was um, stuck at the airport with no wallet and um, no phone, and uh, I mean. Uh, I was able to find the uh, person who um, um, I accidentally took um, my bag um, um, by mistake, but it didn't slow me a bit, and even though I can't prove it, I'm just sure that somehow the uh, coalition's behind this, and it really shows um, you know, um, like how savage they are that you know, they'll go after even, even humble grassroots activists and by us, you know, it's a nasty time. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I've mentioned the ways that work the Dole and Income Management Act, you know, not as ways of um, supporting people, but as ways of punishment and deterrence, you know, saying, you know, we're going to put these hard policies on you so that you don't spend a long time on welfare. And also back to people in the, the workforce, you know, saying to them, you know, don't rock the boat because if you lose on your job, you're going to enter a, um, a social security um, system where you have um, lots of obligations, lots of restrictions on your freedom, and obviously the really, really big one will, will be on a really, really low um, payment. And like increasingly people being moved um, from higher payments like parenting payment, single, and the disability support pension um, to new start. And we have many people in our group who used to be on the uh, DSP, mainly younger people, and they've been um, shifted onto new start. And I mean, the DSP is um, quite a bit higher, but it's still very modest. You know, it's, there's not much to it. Um, and so, what, the point that you made earlier, and I could just um, I want to like, finish off on that, which is that um, you probably all heard the term mutual obligation. You know, we'll give you um, some money and in return will make you do X, um, Y, Z, and you know, yeah, we, we, and it's often um, we couched in terms of um, fairness. We, you know, we're being um, like extraordinarily um, um, generous by keeping you alive. Um, so like in return, um, surely the least that uh, uh, we can ask you to do is to, you know, actively search for work, and, I'm going to a job network every couple of weeks, so like where often you have to go, and, and often income management is justified on uh, uh, a You know, well, it's our money. What's wrong with us? And um, setting a few conditions on how you spend on your money. And I think, I mean, it, it um, takes a bit of courage in um, in today's climate, but I think you're 
I, I would really have to assert that income support or welfare, or, or like whatever term you want to use, is fundamentally an entitlement and, and a right, and it should be made um, conditional. It should be no different um, to help. It should be based um, solely on a need. You know, if you're out of work, it's largely because of factors completely outside um, your control. People out of work want to find work because you know the payments are modest, and also you know, unlike a lot of the state things, there are in some cases you know some social and emotional benefits um, to being able to work. And not always, I mean, there are some pretty appalling jobs out there, but sometimes. And so the idea that we have to set all these um, conditions on people that you know if you don't meet X or Y Z, we're going to break you. We're going to um. Uh, um, deny you the resources that uh, are needed to survive. I think that's um, fundamentally um, wrong, and I don't think uh, we should have like a bar of it all back. I think our position should be that welfare is no different um, to healthcare. None of the judgments about blaming people if they get poor. You know, we don't blame. You know, if someone gets um, sick. Regardless of like how it happened, you know, we don't. Well, most of the time we don't have this kind of judgment. You know, we don't normally talk about the deserving sick and the undeserving um, sick. You know, if someone's in sick, you know, we help them, no questions asked, and that should be our view of of um, welfare. And in particular, in our current situation, uh, where we know that you know, the issue is unstructured. Just not enough jobs and to go around and um, and I mean I think that's uh, uh, where we have to get them back to the idea that income supports a fundamental right. Like you know, the right to um, um, free speech is not um, dependent on X or Y Z. You, you, you have it simply of being a citizen in a certain kind of a um, community. You know. The right into the essentials of life, you know, <coughs> to income support, um, um, should be no different. Eh? And I think it's uh, worth noting all the unique situations where um, a mutual obligation um, doesn't exist. So you know, all those um, corporations who get public and subsidies and to do research and to keep um, their operations here, you know, it seem to be so strict about their obligations. I mean, uh, many of them um, don't even. Seem to pay tax here, as the uh, Panama Papers um, told us. Um, you know they are um, required to invest um, the profits back into the uh, um, local community. Uh, um, in fact, uh, we're completely hands off um, with them in a way that we aren't when it comes to unemployed people. And of course, I mean the whole mutual obligation thing. You know, kind of assumes that. There's this um, fair contract where like the unemployed people sit down on one side of the table, and the government sits down on the other side of the table, and they say, "Hey, you know, let's let's work out a fair bargain. You know, we'll give you guys adequate incomes while you're job um, searching. Um, we'll make sure that there are enough jobs um, to go around, and um, we'll make sure uh, um, there's a well-funded um, community sector with all these um, good services in place and for people you know who need." Extra support, with mental health issues, or substance abuse issues, or, or, or financial literacy issues. Then on the other side of the table, the unemployed people are like, well, okay, that's fair enough. If you guys do all of that, then in return we'll try our hardest and to find work as long as there are like enough jobs to go around. But clearly, that's not the really situation at the moment. I mean, the issue is not unemployed people not meeting their very strict obligations. The issue is the, the government. Um, completely ignoring their obligations. You know, if we're going to talk about mutual obligation, you know, why hasn't new start been raised in the 22 years? You know, why are so many our payments inadequate? You know, why is the government you know, um, not even trying to um, reach full employment? In fact, they barely like acknowledge uh, the idea that um, unemployment is unstructural. You know, for every Daily Telegraph article that. Um, talks about unemployed people being too lazy to show up to their job network appointments or or their job interviews. You know, I'm like, how many articles do we have um, lambasting 
the government for um, for the fact that there's you know one job um, for every five job seekers or or one job for every like eleven job seekers if you if you include the underemployed. Um, the the other point which you've already mentioned is that if you include <coughs> social security, that puts a lot more pressure on employers to give proper jobs mm. because that's a real exactly. issue that there are a lot of jobs where it is fiercely competitive. It's a hostile work environment because there are so many people casualised and on part-time wages who have to pick up extra work to survive. So that that hostile work environment keeps people working under conditions they, they wouldn't want to work under. Yeah. And if you thought that um, um, that um, challenging on your boss or speaking out in some ways would end to um, would end up a uh, review being on two hundred and sixty dollars a week and potentially for months and months, you know, that would certainly make you uh, think twice about how assertive you're going to be uh, as an employee, and, and I particularly in a time like ours where you know. Um, um, you know, unions have been on the uh, back foot. You know, they've uh, um, lost a lot of their power and and um, membership, and they're under a pretty ferocious attack. And just one last point, which I should have uh, made earlier, which uh, which is that our philosophy. In I mean, on the one hand, it sounds pretty basic, but um, uh, uh, on the other hand, I think it's actually like a powerful challenge to how politics happens. Is that um, the experts of poverty? and unemployment are the people themselves. It's poor people and unemployed people. Um, and so as much as possible, our group is led by the people, uh, unlike directly and uh, unlike experience in these issues. Um, but of course, you know, poor people and unemployed people are almost completely absent from political and public debates, except when um, they're used as um, caricatures and scapegoats. And I think it's really a significant, you know, the silencing of unemployed people, the fact that, you know, they have um, no space in the public debate, and that it's assumed that they should be grateful, like, for anything that, you, you know, that, um, they should be grateful for us, uh, um, to their support. So if we decide to set all sorts of conditions around, you know, how they live their lives, how they spend their money, you know, that's fine. They just have to cop it on the chin, the fact that um, um, I mean, if you are like unemployed, you know, you can actually be quite and scary speaking out because, because you face a very hostile media. You know, we've often had the situations and I will train people in our groups, um, like income management clients, to speak out in public. And it's been a major risk for them, and often they've um, caught them quite a bit of them flat. They haven't stopped them doing it, but you know. Um, pointed is not like an easy thing either to speak out. And that culture of stigmatizing people, you know, it, it, it's not just about um, convincing people in work that um, there's a, a, a this class of people on censoring benefits who are taking advantage of their generosity. It, it, it's also about like intimidating this group of people in income support, saying, you know, don't you dare get involved in public debate or, or political debate, but just be grateful for what. And you get, uh, I'm going to give up challenging us.